Yeah. Great innings by Ian Botham. Another 10 for Common Edge. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. Great sport is just like great art. You need a flash of genius. You need the Mavericks in the game, you need the flair players, you need the players who played, you know, at 30, just like they did when he was 15. Freedom of expression. In my heart, I'm still exactly the, that same passionate youngster that was karting from early days. You need to live in the moment. I've always stressed my body out 11 months to get to this one, this one race, and I'm here now. Why stress about it? Now it's time to relax and get it done. But what if these days sport has become so over-professional that we're unable to have fun? I don't think it's really too much of a mystery as to why my career ended up being what it was. I didn't enjoy playing for England. Has inspiration been forgotten? Sport has moved on from uh, just having these natural, talented people. That's not just an instinctive, natural thing. Does thinking get in the way of performing? Some guys can be paralysed by this, definitely, that, that, that eventually they can't swim in the club at all. Is professionalism killing sport? We all remember what it was like being a kid, kicking a ball, chasing after it, racing each other, jumping as high as we could. Sport brings together two of the most natural urges known to man, wanting to compete and above all, wanting to have fun. Sport allows us to lose ourselves in the moment. But kids, enjoy it while you can. Professional sport is no game. When I was a kid, I loved playing sport. Cricket, not football, was my passion. And I was lucky enough that my passion became my profession. And I went on to represent my country. A great chair for his first 50 in test cricket. But now, as a writer for The Times, I think about my playing career differently. I struggled to perform when I felt overcoached, overcomplicated, perhaps overprofessional. Did I allow worrying about my technique to get in the way of self-expression? Perhaps I would have scored more runs if I'd allowed myself to enjoy it more. Were my experiences shared by other professional sportsmen? I'll ask the question, can you become too professional for your own good? Sport used to be amateur, played for the fun and the honor. But with formal competition and money, sport changed. Being a professional was the thing to aspire to, and amateur became a byword for sloppiness and poor performance. As an amateur, you always had that excuse. Uh, um, you kind of get a jail card almost that uh, maybe you weren't preparing quite as well as the other people because of other things going on in your life. I think professional, it's not so much to me about money, it's whether you've got the ability to do it absolutely full time, there's no excuses. And the word professional is just doing everything totally you know, to your best and, and, and that you can look everyone straight in the eye and say that there's nothing else we could have done. Woodward's management of the England rugby team can be seen as the perfect example of modern professionalism. Nothing was left to chance. Preparation and attention to detail were relentless. At the heart of Sir Clive's philosophy is the belief that analysis is a vital factor in the success of all great sportsmen. And I, I always compare this with, with maths. If you just take kicking a football or kicking a rugby ball, uh, you know, I think you should be teaching kids as early as you can you know, how, to, how to do this. But putting real knowledge into their head in terms of you know, why, do, why do I do this, how do I do this, and how do I do it even better. And it worked. England dominated and had a Grand Slam and a World Cup to show for it. And in a sense, professionalism won too. But if the key to winning World Cups is being more and more professional, then the England football team would have been assured of success at this summer's World Cup in South Africa. They had the highest paid coach, a vast support staff, and a tightly controlled training environment. There's a race on between Barry and Ozil, and Ozil has eaten up the ground on Gareth Barry. Again, Muller is over in acres of space, and Ozil has found him, and Muller has sealed it! Germany are going through to the last leg of the World Cup. For all the planning off the pitch, where was the freedom when it mattered? Where was the flair? Where was the fun? 
Was it strangled out of their game by pressure and expectation? Was professionalism tying them in knots? Could it be that what was supposed to make sportsmen win actually made them lose? It is true that the age of professionalism has produced stronger, fitter, more dedicated sportsmen. But maybe there remains a kernel of truth in the amateur ideal. What if professionalism, with its overcoaching and constant analysis, makes it harder for players to do what they do best? Being instinctive, being free, just playing. Conventional wisdom says that professional sport takes talented kids and turns them into hardened professionals. But the striking thing about many top players is that they manage to remain a child at heart. Lewis Hamilton wins again in Canada. You know, I'm in a real uh, a huge business world now, you know, and, and it's partly a job, but you, you, make it, you, you enjoy the, the driving part. In my heart, I'm still exactly the, that same passionate youngster that was karting from early days. And I think that I hope that shows in my overtaking maneuvers, the way I come through the pack and the way I, I carry myself on the track. I still think I'm a kid. I, I don't feel any older now than I did when I was 11. I'm probably not any more intelligent now than I was when I was 11. I think it's not growing up is yeah. what makes you good at sport. <laughs> How can that untutored, childish spirit have any place in the multi-million pound world of modern sport. But perhaps the players who we enjoy watching the most are those who retain their childlike freedom. Oh yeah! Hooray! Oh, and that's a beautiful shot. The double shuffle from Ali. All the old tricks being turned on. That was amazing. We need the mavericks in the game, you need the flair players, you need the players who played just like they're playing you know, at 30, just like they did when he was 15. Eric was like that, Eric Cantona was like that, you wouldn't find anyone more professional than Eric, you know, and when he got on the pitch, he was just, you know, it was all instinctive, it was all flair, it was all, but not just tricks for the fun of it, they were actually effective. I think sport has moved on from uh, just having these natural talented people. I meet thousands of naturally gifted talented people in terms of kids all over the world. What I've found is the people who get to the top, the people who win Olympic gold medals, the, the, the people who win World Cups in, in rugby, the knowledge of what they do is, is very significant. It's not just an instinctive natural thing. You, you're taking your talent to a whole new level, which is normally down to the coach. The coach has the ability to put that knowledge into you. One player who hasn't lost the flair he demonstrated as a child is Ryan Giggs. Manchester United's longest serving player has played at the very top for 21 seasons. Do you think you've sort of kept in touch with that kid that was just brilliant at football and is still, still sort of playing when you play for United now? Yeah, I think you do, because I think even in training, um, you take a couple of players on and score. It's just like a great feeling. It's just what you did when you was 15, 16, playing for your Sunday league team, playing with your mates for school. You have to take all the tactical issues, uh, both as an individual and as a, as a team, but you still try and keep that sort of um, ability that you had when you was younger. Roll back the years again, Ryan Giggs! I've always been an, an instinctive player. I've always, the best things that I've ever done on a football pitch, just you can't explain it, it was just instinctive, it was just your ability, it was just what you, you didn't even think about it. You just took players on, you took a shot on. I, I always get asked about the, the, the goal against Arsenal. Um, what was you thinking, what was your, you know, what, I wasn't thinking anything. I just got the ball and just ran with it, it was as simple as that. But this is still Ryan Giggs who's past Keown, past Dixon, and has scored a sensational goal! The truth is I was having a bit of a nightmare that game. I'd give it away a couple of times and I've just thought, the next time I'm going to get it, I'm just going to run with it and take players on. And that's what I did. And then it wasn't until after, really, that I'd watched it that I'd realised I was so far out, I'd beat so many players. I, I don't know how I did it, it just, it just happened. It was just instinctive, it was as simple as that. I think you know, when you first come into the team, it's just pure instinct. You get told to do what you've been doing in the reserves, what you've been doing in the youth team, and you try things. Still gigs. Then the more you, you get coached and the more you think about stuff, you probably stop doing them sort of things or just hesitate for that, for that moment. The professional system 
can affect even the most instinctive sportsman. Instead of always trying to turn the kid into the professional, perhaps the effort should be the other way, to allow professionals to keep a splash of that childlike instinctiveness. So how do you keep that sense of flair and enjoyment in your game, despite all the pressures of professionalism? Someone who understands the difficulty of realising their potential when not enjoying their sport is Mark Ramprakash. Ramprakash was the outstanding English cricketer of his generation. He had it all. In fact, at age 41, he still does. Athleticism, hunger, patience. But, and it's a big but, for years Ramprakash struggled to convert his county success into test match scores. I think, in the main, I didn't enjoy playing for England. The first five tests I played were against the West Indian side, who were very, very good. I never really got a score to perhaps reinforce my belief that I belonged at that level. And then, with each failure after that, it became more and more difficult. You know, confidence really ebbed away. Rampakash goes for naught, and England are in some sort of disarray out there now. What with uh, the low scores that I had, I found it very difficult to relax uh, and enjoy and, and go out and play as I perhaps would when I felt part of my county side. Other players might have faded away, but amazingly, there was to be another stage in Ramps' journey. He put England behind him, and where others would have lost their love for the game and shunned the limelight, Ramprakash took to the floor. Totally brilliant. <laughs> as someone who knew him well as an opponent, I remember watching Mark on Strictly Come Dancing. The audacity he could show at the crease returned. He began to have fun, and he triumphed. Mark and... I think when you experience something like that outside of your normal little bubble, which cricket is, um, it can only help you to, to come out and express yourself on a, on a field where, I suppose, in a way, you can be a bit extrovert on the cricket field. Um, as you have to be a bit extrovert when you're on the dance floor. Um, so I think it, it was such a great thing um, that I really enjoyed and certainly it's had an impact as well for me playing cricket. Having won Strictly as a 37-year-old, Mark Ramprakash averaged 100 the following season, then 90 the next. Phenomenal statistics, even by his standards. I've had good concentration but also a relaxed way about me at the crease and I think the balance is, is you know, you're sort of always looking for a that better balance. You might need to enjoy the game itself, but no professional sportsman could claim to enjoy every step along the way. Suffering and sacrifice come with a job. When I hit 30, I made a lot of sacrifices. You know, trying not to drink alcohol, um, I started doing yoga, um, changed my diet. Um, it's probably been my most successful time since I turned 30. Oh boy, oh, ay, ay. I've broken my ankle, my leg, my arm, my wrist, uh, lower vertebrae, so I've got metal in um, the middle of my back, um, shoulder blades, collarbones, cheekbones. AP McCoy is the most successful jump jockey of all time, with over 3,000 winners. But he's had to suffer for his success. A constant battle to maintain low weight can push jockeys such as AP to their emotional limits. There are some days it, 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 it is tough. You know, I've seen myself, you know, getting on a treadmill, going for a run, then getting in a hot bath for an hour, um, and getting out of a hot bath and literally, and. I have seen myself practically crying, getting out of a hot bath. You know, being, you know, being that exhausted from from trying to get down to to, to a really low weight. You know, um, but you know, you just you have to accept that that's part of the job. What keeps you motivated? I mean, you've been champion jockey what 15 times. Yeah, I mean, what keeps me motivated? Um, probably the same thing that has done from from the first day I was champion jockey was the fear of not being champion jockey. So it's almost like, even though you've achieved everything, there's still a little bit of a fear of failure. Uh, there's always been a fear of failure. There's always been a fear of slipping down, you know. I've lived like that for 15 years. 
in a life so dominated by suffering and sacrifice. Where is the fun for AP McCoy? Just to, to just try and enjoy it and, and, and try and win as, as much as possible, and that is what makes it enjoyable, you know? The winning. The winning, the winning. It's that way the around. Win, the, winning, the winning's everything, really, you know, at the end of the day. Winning is what makes it enjoyable. You know? Don't push it, Tony McCoy, at the 15th attempt. He wins the Grand National. Motivation is pure and simple winning. I just love to win. Laura Davis is Britain's most successful female golfer. In a career spanning over 25 years, her approach to her craft has often caused comment. Everyone goes on about the fact that I don't practice as much as some of the others. Some of them are up the golf course 12, 14 hours a day, and I, I find that scary. I mean, I, if I'm up there more than seven hours in any given day, it's way too long. The ones that really want to go on and on, that's not the way to do it. Does professionalism, with its one-size-fits-all approach, overlook the differing needs of individual players? A lot of the younger players spend, in my opinion, way too long out there, and that's why after four or five possible really good years, they disappear. You have to find your own formula, and um, you, you work out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. You need to make the most of what you've got. Don't cut corners, uh, and then you will, you will get the benefits. You will, you'll be happy within yourself that, yeah, I've, I've done the best I can to make the most of my ability. So in a sense, all the training is something that stops you having to worry about anything, and then you can just get out there and express yourself. Yeah, because you can go into a game knowing that you're prepared right. Never forget the ability that you've got in yourself, but also prepare yourself the right way. In a funny way, all the hard work off the pitch helps gigs to relax on the pitch. This guy takes that relaxation to another level. You see him both swinging away from the field. It's a new world record. He didn't even try all of the way. While his opponents give the impression of tension and concentration, the fastest man in the world seems to be the most carefree. I train 11 months for the year. And this we train for one moment. And when you get to that moment, you can't do anything more. No matter how much you try to focus, you have already done starts, the, the background work, the sprinting work. It's all down to this now. You gotta just relax and get it done. You know exactly what you need to do. So there's no need to really like, focus and stress yourself out anymore because you have already done that 11 months already. It's all all the way. He's looking round at Gay. Watch the clock. It's gold for four. That's my personality, I like to have fun. I, I really try to enjoy myself in everything I do, and this is good for the sport, because more people want to watch the sport. The more I do this, and more people come along and they show their personalities and do different different things, it's more exciting for the sport. So uh, I'll always keep doing it, and this is just my personality. That's just me being me. Someone will always win the 100 meters. What makes this someone a bit special is the manner in which he wins. He wins with flair, he wins with style, and he makes us smile. If he wasn't at the heart still the boy who just loved running, he wouldn't be the fastest man on the planet today. Even in the ultra-professional landscape of modern sport, a few islands of amateurism still remain. Take the Ryder Cup. No prize money, no ranking points, no tour cards. Just the privilege of trying to beat America. Just like the old days, really. And how we love it. European golf still reigns supreme. Captain in Europe this year is Colin Montgomery, a veteran of eight Ryder Cups. We only play for nothing once every two years, and I think it's not enough. I think that's the beauty of the Ryder Cup, and it should, and it should remain that way. We're doing this for the passion. We're doing this to try and beat, of course, an old foe in America. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we're doing this for the passion of the game, and I think we don't do this enough. Ryder Cup, you seem not only to play your best, but also mm. to enjoy it the most. Is that a fair...? I think so. I think so. I think in any sport, in any business, in anything you do in life, if you enjoy what you do, I'm, I'm fairly convinced you're fairly good at it. Uh, it's like anyone. I mean, you, you know, if you go to work in a widget factory, but if you enjoy making those widgets and take pride in those widgets, you'll be a very good widget maker, uh, uh, as, I, as I am playing R Ryder Cup golf. Oh, Colin, Colin, Colin. I think he may explode. Just wait till the pit, please, in future. Have there been times in your non-team career, so that's when yes, you were playing yes. for Colin Montgomery, just, just you, yes. where you haven't felt that? Oh, very much, very much. There's been situations where physically, mentally, I'm, I'm not enjoying 
what I'm doing, but never in Ryder Cup playing. Is this to win the hole? Get it, Soil! Yeah. And he's hold it. That's a beautiful call in. Montgomery has always played with freedom and joy during Ryder Cups. It seemed lacking in his pursuit of major victories. If you've been able to say, I am playing as if I'm in a Ryder Cup now, mm -hmm. but I'm playing for myself in a major, yes, yes. and I'm going to enjoy it as if I'm playing in a Ryder Cup, mm -hmm. do you think that would have helped you to get over the line? I think so. I think so. People have said to me very, very many times that, that, that uh, if I'd played the way I have it in Ryder Cup play, I'd have won a few majors by now. The enjoyment Monty found in playing merely for honour might have brought him more rewards elsewhere. Sometimes a touch of the joyful amateur spirit makes for a better professional. Clive Woodward has a more pragmatic approach. But you've got to define what enjoyment means. Enjoyment isn't, isn't sort of laughing, and, you know, that's all part of it. But, but I think the more you know what you do, the more you understand what you do, and the more knowledge you've got what you do, the more you can enjoy it and the chances are you, you, you're, you're going to do it better. There's now a whole industry of professional sports analysis. Obviously, it can be a useful tool. But isn't there a danger that too much thinking gets in the way of the playing? There's so many theoretical books been written about golf. I mean, you know, it could fill a library about how to swing the golf club, the textbook way of swinging a golf club. And I think uh, that some guys uh, can be paralyzed by this, definitely, that, that, that eventually they can't swing the club at all. Well, I've never read a golf book. If it's a Seve or someone who's been there and done that, but most coaches have never been good golfers. Someone talking in your ear, telling you to do this and this with your club head should be here, and they probably can't do it themselves. I, I don't understand that in any aspect at all. A good friend of mine, Carol Ellen, who used to write, you know, always said that, you know, but giving me instructions and that, that I'm, I'm, I'm better off if you just, he, he reckons I was, uh, much more an instinct person, you're better off letting me get on with it. You might well be just uh, thinking about what you're having for dinner uh, on that evening and you just hit a golf shot close to a pin and you think, that's amazing, I haven't thought about, thought about uh, technique, I haven't thought about where I'm at the top or whatever the case may be. Almost like you did when you were a kid. Is yes, that... yes, yeah, yeah, and I think it's that simplistic way that, uh, that aren't the simple things in life the best? There's another question too. Is ultra-professionalism a sustainable way to live. What does it do to you as a human being? If you narrow your life too much, are you inevitably going to snap? It's a question that takes us to the heart of Tiger Woods' career. He's one of the most successful golfers of all time, the highest paid sportsman in the world. With 14 majors under his belt, the man's a global phenomenon. It will gather down towards the hole. Has he judged it well? He has. This is a wonderful shot from Tiger Woods. It's crawling, crawling towards the hole. Will it reach? Will it reach? On the edge for Tiger Woods and in! Is that the shot to win the Masters for Tiger Woods? As a grudging genius, Woods is the embodiment of modern professionalism. I think he's the greatest sports person that that I've seen in, in, in my time, you know, obviously to go and play golf and, and actually be that close to him and see, watch him doing what he's better than everyone else at was, was amazing. That's, and, and you can see when you're playing golf with him where the focus comes from, where the attitude, I could think I could see his whole mental state of mind, you know, that what makes him, what has made him what he is. Throughout Tiger's problems, the question has remained, how can the world's best golfer derive so little pleasure from being so gloriously good at hitting a golf ball? Come on, guys, watch your cameras. Some sportsmen act cold to gain a competitive edge. With Woods, you sense it goes all the way to his core, as if personality is a form of weakness. A flaw to be ironed out, like a faulty backswing. Once, sport was about building character. Now it seeks to eliminate it. His pursuit of control and perfection has strangled the joy out of his game and his life. There was a few people that stayed at his house, a few of my colleagues, and they were listening downstairs, and at four o'clock in the morning, they heard the, the dumbbells and they heard the bars and they heard the machines going at four o'clock in the morning. Now, yes, I've heard about driven driven men before but that is that that's extraordinary every day uh, and uh, and i suppose you know you can't continue like that forever tiger's joyless exercise and self-denial works for few people now we're learning 
it isn't even working for him. I was unfaithful. I had affairs. I cheated. I knew my actions were wrong, but I convinced myself that normal rules didn't apply. I thought I could get away with whatever I wanted to. I felt that I had worked hard my entire life and deserved to enjoy all the temptations around me. I felt I was entitled. I'm just glad that he's coming back into the game of golf. I'm sure he'll be in the Ryder Cup team, which will be great for Wales and great for the Ryder Cup as whole. And we just hope that uh, he gets back uh, to his best as soon as possible. People usually argue that the rest of his life is damaging Tiger's golf. In fact, maybe it's too much golf that has harmed the rest of his life. Off the pitch, you need to be relaxed. You need to get away from football as well. You know, it's not just football, football, football. We've got two young kids, so that helps when you've had a bad game or you've had a bad result. You know, all the, they usually say, you, did you score? And you just, that's the last thing you want to hear. But that sort of, no, I didn't, I had a nightmare, but <laughs> that sort of lightens things up. Oh, you've got, you've got to have other interests. I mean, for me, it's going out with the, with the boys, my caddy, Johnny, and the other, the other guys, having a, go, a few games of pool in the evening. You know, any, anything that just gets you away from the golf course so you're not living and breathing it. Where I've enjoyed watching football, tr trying to learn golf, you know, doing other things, you know, being with my kids. And so those um, other things in my life have been very important. So when I come back to cricket, I feel very enthusiastic, very refreshed. Wimbledon Championship for Roger Federer, number 15 overall. Roger Federer is arguably the greatest tennis player of all time, but he's also challenged the idea that a real winner can't also be a balanced, normal human being. Having uh, had kids, to travel with them has been, it's been great. Um, and uh, they've been good as well, good girls. Mirka's been doing really well as well, and uh, I, I like my life uh, as a father traveling with the kids like this. That sense of perspective isn't just for show. He's combined the consistency of the ultimate professional with the grace of the perfect amateur. He's one of the greatest sportsmen in the world and among the most sportsmanlike. Fair play uh, as a start, I think, and then you know, day in, day out, being able to you know, play a good match and uh, be a good role model too. Uh, I think for kids, I think that's also very important. Undoubtedly, he is a great, but greatness hasn't cost him his love of the game. He still finds joy in the astonishing things he can do with a tennis racket. I began by asking a question: Can professionalism harm sportsmen as much as it helps them? We've learned that professionalism has made for fitter, stronger bodies than ever before. And we've seen that you can't get to the top on talent alone. Not anymore. But we've learned something deeper, something more surprising. That even the most professional sportsman needs to find sport more than just a job. You need a sense of joy too. And they're the players that fans tend to love. So the ultimate professional has to keep hold of something that might sound amateurish. The ability to enjoy sport and to be themselves. Fitting every player into the same professional mould can take them away from what made them so good in the first place. Perhaps it's not just the kids who could learn from the pros. Perhaps the pros can still learn from the kids. And taking on the professionals next on BBC One, an amateur attempts to win the US Open in golfing drama, the greatest game ever played. <laughs>